Welcome to Music from Humans. In this episode, we unfurl the scroll of an avant-garde musician, striking a chord with the soul of San Francisco or tuning into Philip Greenlee, the saxophone alchemist whose notes are etched into the very streets of the Bay Area. Philip isn't just a performer, he's a pioneer who's been shaping the pulse of postmodern jazz music since the 70s. With his horn as his compass, he navigated the endless seas of jazz, experimental, and all that lies in between, emerging as a figure celebrated in downbeat and jazz times while being spotlighted by NPR among its top ten. His saxophone speaks in many tongues, from the profound conversations in duos with icons like Trevor Dunn and Scott Amendola to the experimental whispers of animals and giraffes echoing through the halls of the Center for New Music as an ensemble in residence. Beyond the stage, Phillips the maestro in the classroom, shaping the minds of San Francisco's Wardorf High School and California Jazz Conservatory, sowing the seeds of tomorrow's jazz landscape. A true architect of the Bay Area's DIY ethos, Phillips the glue of the grassroots scene, a connector creating spaces and sounds to collide and coalesce. His label, Evander Music, is a beacon of the avant-garde, always propelling jazz to its next evolution. Join us on Music from Humans as we prepare for a journey through the sonic landscapes of modern-day jazz visionary. This is Philip Greenleaf, and his music is a revolution in every breath. Well, Philip, it's uh, great to have you on. You know, we've, uh, we haven't ever really worked together, but we've worked with some of the same people. Um, you know, Absolutely. you worked with Shoko Akaji. She was on one of my albums, and you do a lot of stuff with John Roskin, and I've been on an album with him, and he's come into my orchestra and played. So, uh, you know, from the, from our, our distances there, we, we've, we've worked around the same people, but certainly I've followed your music and, and a lot of your, your really uh, great projects. You're quite the icon here in the Bay Area. You know, what I'd really like to talk about is your, your graphical scores, because you, you're, you're known for some really amazing graphical scores. And I was talking with other composers, you know, everybody has their own approach to graphical scores and some are more utilitarian graphical scores, but a lot of yours are almost look like art. I mean, they're, they're quite, they're quite amazing to look at. Um, And I am, I'm really curious about what your approach is to them, how you use them, how musicians are interpreting your work to get the results that you're after. Right. It, it's funny that you use the word utilitarian because the first time I came up with some, I had made this trip to Russia in 98 and had this amazing summer and wanted to write music for this quartet. I was, I was living up here, but you know, I grew up in Los Angeles. So, um, I wanted to go back home, so to speak, and do this project with Nels Klein and Vinnie Golia and G. Stinson. Well, Nels and Vinnie and I all read traditional notation, but G. E., who's an incredible guitar player with so many, like his palette is enormous, sound palette is enormous. Um, And these guys were kind of mentors of, of mine. You know, they were just like one generation ahead of me. So I wanted to make these scores to um, for that project, and I couldn't use traditional notation. I could use fragments or little motifs, but that wasn't going to work. I just so so I came up. I started by using some uh, game strategies. I came up with. I used photographs from of all these cathedrals that I had seen in the city of Novgorod, which was a, it was an incredible trip. Mostly I was in St. Petersburg that summer. Um, so yeah, those pieces on that record, I just had to kind of invent rather quickly a way of communicating ideas. And after, you know, if you think about that project, that's two guitar players and two, 
read players. So when Raskin, you re you mentioned John Raskin, um, he and I wanted to make a project, and I really liked at the time. I mean, the journey to Russia was such a unique experience in my life. And I think probably you and most people can relate that a place, right, a location where you are has a big influence on what you do. So I started to think about maps. I really like the way maps look. Um, and going back to that Russian notebooks project, that place had an enormous influence. So I started to look at maps, and John had made some scores um, that were really nice to look at. And I have a great appreciation for visual arts, but I have no, <laughs> I have no chops. I mean, I can kind of draw, you know. So I thought, well, what am I? I want to make. I want to make graphic scores. I had been considering them for a long time. And I didn't just want to draw shapes and say, play the shape. I wanted to have, I wanted to, like you said, I wanted to make it my own. And, you know, William Burroughs, the composer, has had a big influence on my work and his cut up principle of, which is really collage with language. I thought about those things and I just started to make collages with maps using these maps. Because I had gone to, um, I don't know if you remember that store on Market Street, that um, that amazing art store, like where Valencia hits Market Street. What was it called? Flax. Um, Flax, yeah. Uh, my wife's an artist, so I spent a lot of time there. Right. So, same. And uh, so I walk in there and they had this like... Uh, it was almost like wrapping paper that you could buy. And the, and the big, big sheets of paper had these really unusual looking maps of Tokyo, of Paris, and some other places. And um, John and I had started this two plus two project. And we wanted to make scores that you could talk through with the players and not have to have an elaborate rehearsal because there just wasn't, there just wasn't time, you know? Um, so, I mean, that's got to do with economics and all sorts of things. So yeah, graphic scores seem to be the way to go. And I had taken a trip to Paris I had taken a little four city tour in Europe in 99 and my mother was getting older. She'd always wanted to go to Europe. She never had a chance to go. Uh, I think by the time my parents were settled enough to like make that kind of a trip, my father's health was really declining. So I invited her to come with me. And I played in Amsterdam, Cologne, Paris, and Bruges. And so at the time I started to make this score, my mom was ailing. She was, you know, her health was really declining. So I found this cool map of Paris and I thought, I'm going to make this, I'm going to dedicate this first one to my mom. And um, so the first map score, Paris, was written in, 2004 or five, maybe. And um, it was a little primitive, to be honest. There was, I had the map and I had red and green construction paper and a lot of pitches and some rhythms. And just really simple. And um, it was, it was really cool. It, it worked a simple score like that produced some beautiful music. So from there, I just, I just started exploring more and more what you would call um, compositional elements to put on the page. And there were rules at first about how you get from one place to another. Um, if you were in a map element, 
if you there'd be the like the big page and then there would be pieces of maps organized on the page and if a compositional element was touching a map then that was something that you could open up and improvise with but if a compositional element was just on the blank page you had to deal with it in a more strict fashion so and then over time those rules kind of became more complex about how you got from place to place depending on the piece um the last several years maybe the last five or six years the whole page is covered in maps so that everything on the page um can be opened up and developed through improvisation you know the nice thing about it is that there's and then you know it's enabled me to write scores with dancers because you know how how do you write something for a dancer you know you, you if a dancer is reads traditional notation maybe that's okay but that's not going to make sense to them you know their movement if you write a melody how is that going to communicate a compositional idea to a dancer so the cool thing about the map scores is that it's allowed me to collaborate with a lot of different people um the compositional elements change from collaboration to collaboration ah oh, that's cool i've always been a bit of a fan of multimedia style works you know and that can mean yeah. you're you have a dancer that's working with you or video um yeah so i i, I understand how that that could really be a, an advantage to that uh, it, you, you touched a little bit about the the rules and and i get how each piece might have a slightly different set of rules you know there are some graphic scores where you just look at a picture and you you play off of that inspiration but there's other graphic scores that that are more compositional in a, in a way. I'm, I'm curious about how you use that. I had a residency at Headlands and there was a dancer there who had come out to do something with Anna Halperin. We started to just improvise in my space. And I thought about what are common terms that could be used? So, um, and this dancer was from Chicago. So I used maps of Chicago, map elements of Chicago. And in addition to writing for every, for every musical element, a melody, a set of pitches, a rhythm, I also gave a text score, um, element. So, you know, I had this like one stack of a couple stacks of chords in one area and the 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 prompt always bending so you know a dancer knows what to do that with that and a, and someone that plays an instrument that can you know really bend the pitch can knows what to do with that um we talked about police corruption in Chicago. And so there was this little chromatic passage. And, you know, it's called the Windy City. And um, so there was a prompt for the dancer that said the wind corrupts. So if you think about I don't know, a movie like The Wizard of Oz, there's a tornado, right? What's the tornado sound like? It also has this kind of almost like a, a you know, a very glissy, siren-y kind of um, sound to it. And so the dancer, because this came out of our conversation, the dancer knew exactly what to do with that. It's just like never really, if she was in that area, you know, her movement was never stationary. It was always, you know, all over the place, right? The Muni, the streetcar, whatever you want to call it, is called the loop. So that was one way that, you know, I made this little, I took 
a map of Chicago and use the little icons of the loop and place them all over the score. So if you wanted to get from one place to another, you could take the loop. So, you know, what does that mean for a musician, right? It means you make a loop. You know, that sort of thing. And for a dancer too, a repetitive movement could be a way to get from place to place. There's another set of graphic scores that I have made called barbed wire. Maybe mm. you look at those. I mean, those are lines and I could talk about that, but the, you know, if a line has a barb in it, it looks like a piece of barbed wire. Um, that barb represents an accident. So this idea that you're doing something and wham, there's a mis you might, you know, maybe someone calls it a mistake, but it's a kind of break in the signal. It's a kind of radical fluctuation in what you're doing. So that could be, I use those little strands of information as another way of getting from place to place. And because Ch Chicago's right on the lake, um, you know, there's all these water icons all around the score. So if you go to water, you just wait. So it's, mm. it's just saying, stop, rest, pause, reflect, don't do anything, you know, like, I know, you know, Pauline, uh, Pauline Oliveros, you know, one of her, she almost always has this cue in her works, especially her tech scores saying, just listen. So mm -hmm. it's integrating non-activity into the work. Yeah, well, I mean, space is, right, equally as important as, as, as everything else. So yeah, uh, I always find the really good improvisers put in that space or the improvising composers will ensure people drop out at certain pines to change the texture, the sound. And, and yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You, you have specific parts of your piece to remind people to yeah. chill out, take a break, listen, figure out what's going on before you move in and, and sh yeah. it'll change the texture. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So those are some examples. I think that, I think that piece in particular was the first piece where I really added a lot of different ideas on how to get from place to place. Um, like I'm saying with the ones that are more recent that are covered in maps, then it's just up to the player. You can move anywhere you want in the, in the score. The first pieces had these dots. And the little dots connecting the bigger icons, the bigger air sound areas were meant to represent small sounds. And then there were some big red dots that represent big sounds. So mm. you're doing something, maybe you're using pitches and you want to get over to this other area where you have these rhythms. So you, you stop doing the one thing and you use these little teeny sounds to get over to this other area. Oh, and I called them stepping stones because it kind of looked like it. I'd make these little pathways, right? And uh, yeah, that was, that was the original, that was the original way of getting from place to place. But that's just transformed a lot over the years. Yeah, well, you uh, know, you're, you're, that's, always true right every time you write something you get a new idea want to experiment um especially sure. too i'm sure you um develop your work for that particular group or ensemble and so you have a sense of what their strengths and weaknesses are or you know right. or, or even just the concept of of your current that project if i was going to write one for you for example i would say where's a place that you've been that where you had the most remarkable experience and tell me about that experience and 
because again, this idea that place is something that's really special. And, and then that way, you're also using your memory, mm -hmm. your memory of this place and this experience has, it's, it's meaningful for you, right? Yeah, I'd send you to my home away from home, Taipei or something like that. You've got the experience of, uh, of working with certain players, um, you know, which I think every time I talk to an improviser, improviser, composer type, selecting your players and who you're going to work with, you know, is always a really big piece about uh, the su the success and 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 even the way they may set up pieces. Now, you're also a pretty big educator uh, here in the Bay Area, and you have one of your lectures or educational events is about uh, improvising, composing uh, process. Yeah. I think, uh, right? So, uh, and I know you use some of the maps on that. What are some of the things uh, like, uh, and I, 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 but if I if I follow this correctly, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, these are people who uh, do a lot more improvising than composing, and you're sort of showing them. And uh, in a lot of my work, it comes in the other way around. I've got a lot of people who are straight ahead players, and I'm trying to get them to improvise uh, through the pieces. So it's sort of a very different hack, and and I'm curious what you could share about the things you you tell these improvisers of how to compose or structure their 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 improvisation i introduced them to compositions that influenced me um and then i you know i might so we'll start with um i don't know if you've seen you know, Anthony Braxton's has composed so much work. It's astonishing, like the volume of work that he that he's created over the years. In one of his big works, there's an index. It's the first page of his sound index, and there's like you know one through ten short sounds, long sounds, long sounds with accents. You know, there's all these little. There's, t there's a list of 10. Mm -hmm. Now, you go through in other works and, you know, he's got all these little icons that mean other kinds of strategies. So I start that class by asking people to make a list of their strategies. You know, you're, you're making an index of mm -hmm. things that you like to do, things that you you feel you do well with your instrument. And I think each player, you know, has, whether they're aware of it or not, I guess this is the idea is to get the player aware of their vocabulary. Right. right. Um, you're making a dictionary of your, your approaches. So that's the first step. And then I show them a piece that I wrote called Index, um, which I just wanted to do something different. I wanted to make a list of words that would inspire me to play a certain way. You know, this question Camus asks, what inspires us to action, is a very interesting question. So I made this list, and at first, my idea was just to put those words on a score in a random way with no connection whatsoever. But as I started to write them on the page, I began to, of course, you know, the mind just wants to group things. The mind wants to structure things. So I began to group words together that I thought might have an interesting spin to it so let's say um there's wind let's say there's the word nightmare let's say there's the word bat let's say that there's the word soft so those words soft nightmare bat wind i would group i i draw little circles around the words and then put these little webs you know like 
if you're mind mapping things, you know. So the score is this conglomeration of all these little webs of words, the line connecting one word for an, to another might suggest a structure. Um, because maybe the way I've got it organized is you have to go from wind to nightmare to bat to soft. Right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But maybe I don't do that. Maybe I've got the lines arranged so that you can go from any word to any other word in that little cluster. Um, so in this way, I made a kind of catalog of ideas or sound prompts that are just one word um, that have a whole variety of structure. Now, that's kind of fun to use that with a big group because if I were to cue you, your instruction is to wait until I cue you and then just your eyes go, whatever cluster of words attracts your attention in that moment, that's where you go and you work in that area until I cut you off. And then when I cue you again, same process. You go to this other web. What inspires us to do something on our instrument uh, what did what prompts have meaning for you? Can you compose a piece where you imagine doing the same thing, in, but with your language or your? So yeah, using text as a prompt, and then the classic sort of Oliveros Stockhausen text pieces where there's instructions. Begin by imagining the perfect. I'm making this up as I'm talking right now, but you know, the prompt, maybe the prompt is begin by imagining a perfect harmony and express that, right? So not one word, but a sentence. A, uh, you're giving someone an instruction. So I call those text scores. I think most people call those text scores these days. And then, um, let's see, uh, graphic scores, using images because we are a visual we're a visual culture uh, educators say the visual learning mode is the most common for people yeah as opposed yeah. to kinetic um as opposed to you know uh words um language and then i get into game strategies imagine writing a piece that's a game what are the rules to the game? Um, you know, I might use one of one or two of Zorn's hockey or any of those pieces, Cobra. Again, those are like all these prompts and there's rules and um, yeah. And then there's, I guess, you know, then the idea of the map score is really a collage where you could, now that you've created, you've worked in these different modes how can you imagine putting all of them together or a few of them together in one score in a collage-like manner? Or you don't have to be collage. It could be organized however you want to organize it. But it's a multiple mode. It offers multiple modes of compositional element. That's sort of the synopsis of that class. Yeah, that that's that's pretty cool. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, I've studied a little bit with uh, Larry Oakes and the radar techniques, which again get it. Oh yeah, as one of my uh, professors in college wrote a series of pieces called Circle Music. I was um, influenced by um, by Stockhausen, a particular piece of Stockhausen's, mm -hmm. and uh, and also has a little bit uh, of, of of Riley um, in there, like in C. Uh, nice. And that was a big influence to me. And I've written a bunch of these circle music pieces, like circle, circle music piece for jazz, or one of my albums. And I, a couple a year or so ago, I I did a uh, pen circles, which was a big orchestra piece. And it's a little bit like what you're talking about the web, um, except for text. I've got like musical phrases, like um, yeah, you know, like like Riley would, you know, little sections like that. And then sure. uh, each circle, people can mirror. So. Mm -hmm. 
it's very to me it, which what's so interesting is um a lot of these concepts in with graphical scores um they're similar they're, they're very 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 similar thing just everybody having their own tact and approach uh and and then how it creates a whole bunch of different sounds like it's a, it in some ways it's a smaller set of what you can do with these but then the result is is an enormous result of of sounds and music that come think come out of these ideas yeah well like you say you, you it's all predicated based on who you're writing for and what mm. you know and what are they you know what do they do best you know um and if you're writing for folks who are really used to seeing notes on a staff that's what you give them um yeah and maybe you begin by, you know, giving them pitch sets. Well, by by concrete melodies that you want to hear. The question is usually like, how much information do you have to give the player yeah, to get a result? Yeah, to get the result you want, you know, yeah. or or sometimes I don't even necessarily know what result I want. I mean, I don't love the term experimental music but maybe that's you know there is a, of course there's an element of that you think okay well i'm gonna throw this at them and let's, let's see what you know, let's see what happens let's see right. what they let's do. see what comes out yeah and yeah. And, and i agree because I, I do that too there'll be there'll be parts where there are praises right and there'll be parts where it's a pitch set and they say, go for it. And there'll be parts where it's a very jazz type of thing. I'll give them a scale and say, improvise. Some of that is based on people's comfortableness that I've worked with on some of these. And others are just really what I'm trying to get out of it. Like, yeah, I really do want to set up this sort of sound in this group. And then I want something different on top of it. And I just want to let people go and we'll see what happens. And Yeah. Um, I don't know. I always like chatting with other composers, too, because they got different experiences and then when you hear their stories you go oh right yeah that explains what was happening for me too and and you can find yeah. these connections of experiences uh yeah so that always excites me when 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 that sort of happens and i know you are uh for family reasons departing from the bay area as a big loss yeah. for us definitely gonna miss all that you've given our musical scene certainly our loss will be maine's great victory <laughs> well i travel a lot so i'll be here I'm... I'm sure you'll be back to play shows oh, yeah. and concerts. i'll be because your educational stuff will probably miss the most i'm sure because you won't be necessarily here to to teach all the next generation all the good information you've acquired mm -hmm. but um thanks so, yeah that. we will miss you uh but uh, thank God you were here for all those years and and gave us so much. And not that you will you'll will just now get it from afar and and hear you when you come come by to jam. So, all right. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time to do it. Uh, no problem. I really appreciate you taking the time and chatting with me. I I certainly enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. <laughs>